All right, Gordon Clay, uh, local advocate activist. Uh, the issues that you uh, you uh, center your uh, your energies around uh, bullying and uh, suicide prevention. And uh, you've been on KFUG several times, and you yep. say you're out you're out making the tour today and talking to everybody. Uh, we're right at the beginning of October. Uh, what's special about right now? October is Bully Prevention Month, mm -hmm. and both or the county, Donard County, Crescent City, City, and the school district all approved a proclamation to proclaim this month as Bully Prevention Month which is nice to have the whole community in that area behind it. Mm -hmm. And what we're really working with now is sort of an offshoot of what last month was, which was Suicide Prevention Month. And they, these three groups did it then too, uh, to proclaim that Suicide Prevention Month. But now it's going into bullying and we're looking at the combination of the two. What happens it's sort of backwards, you it know, be bullying the starts, but these are national programs, and so this is the way it is. So we talk about suicide prevention, that kind of thing, and then here's one of the causes for a lot of suicides, and it's bullying. And it's really getting, getting school districts to do due diligence on training their teachers mm -hmm. and staff and students to see the signs, see what bullying is. It's a lot more difficult to recognize bullying than it is suicide, and it's still difficult for people to be trained to learn what uh, the warning signs are for suicide. But the about 84% of the bullying that goes on, this is a national figure, is never recognized. And only about 4% Anything that is recognized, anything's done about it. Oh wow! So it's really stepping up. You know, the the school districts have a lot to worry about, and all the school shootings. There aren't many, and they don't impact many people. And the chance of a school district of having a shooter uh, is really pretty remote. But it's a concern with a lot of people right now. And the thing that I talk about is that's a concern. But you're going to spend a lot of money. It's going to take a long time to make all the schools like prisons so she can't get in or out. In the meantime, what's going on in the school that's not being recognized, that causes long-term damage for kids. And it, for both, and I just read this recently, for both the student who is bullied, and that we assume causes a lot of problems long term, etc., and it creates things called ACEs, which are uh, advanced childhood uh, trauma or something like that. Things that happen in a kid's life mm -hmm. up to 18, and I had six of those, so I'm I'm surprised that I survived. But it, it, the big impact we're just finding out is on the bully, mm -hmm. and they've done long term studies now that the bully is more impacted negatively in society long term, getting into alcohol and drugs, that kind of thing at a higher rate than the, the people that are bullied. So it's, it's really interesting that we worried about the bullied kids and I want to stay on them because they are the ones that are dropping out mm -hmm. or dropping out of school or are really afraid to go from one class to another and terrified to go to the bathroom because in the bathrooms, if they are, if there's an adult present, then it's a safe bathroom. And actually, I think by law now you've got to have two adults in the room with any children, uh, unless it's an open classroom with a lot of people. But where there's a chance to have one one child and one adult, there needs to be two adults there for support. For the kid, that nothing's going to happen, but also support for the adult that there's not a false claim. Mm -hmm. uh, but they, they, we want to get it to where a kid can go down the hall and not have a thought about that and get an education. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's 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 too bad that you have to worry about so many of these other other things that shouldn't be a part of the experience. Right. But, but it's right. interesting too that you're talking about uh, sort of focusing efforts to 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 I don't know approach the the, the mindset of the bully. 
Right. Because the bully too suffers and and leads to you know can be a, or can lead to other societal ills later on as this person is obviously maladjusted and is going to struggle the rest of their lives to to interact with other people right. constructively. That's interesting. Wow. Well, it might not be that maladjusted. Okay, but it's one of these things of top dog and mm -hmm. the top cheerleader, the the football player, you know, the big name in the football field, uh, the. The leaders in the what would be the business, the guys that go into business, or women and men that go into business, etc. Mm -hmm. And the really tough thing, of course, with bullying now that you and I didn't have, and we're in totally different generations, <laughs> but is cyberbullying. Oh yeah, yeah. And what would happen? Uh, I was bullied in school. What would happen is it would take days for something, whether it was false or not, to do the rumor rumor mill. I had 483 kids in my senior class, oh, you know, students. And it'd take a long time. Right now, something happens in a class, the kid gets on a break, they send that to all their friends, their friends send it to all their friends, mm -hmm. and by the time that break is over, almost, well, any kid that had a cell phone and checks it, and a lot of them do now, I don't know if they're outlawed here uh, during the day, uh, in Del Norte Unified. I but, don't I don't believe so, yeah, not yet. But there's been talk about that. I think. But the, it's, it just spreads so fast. Mm -hmm. And with, with the culture that we've got where uh, there's so much fake news and the kids are picking up fake news and there's no identifier on, on, the, on the fake news, is the word that gets spread out, people don't have to take responsibility of putting their name on it. Mm -hmm. So it's not like... I told you what went on with Joe. It's like somebody told me, and I sent it to all my friends, and it just, it's really, it's really scary. Yeah, yeah. Because it, it just quickly damages so many lives. Well, what sorts of things can educators or parents or even students do to, to sort of counter that, that culture of, of bullying? The big one is to, well, recognize it. We've got to recognize it. And uh, according up in Oregon, in California, they do a biennial survey on bullying. And I've, I don't have them memorized here. I've got some stats on that. But in, in Oregon, uh, they do it every year. And uh, every year with 6th and 8th graders and on the off year with, I mean, 8th and 11th graders, and on the off year with 6th, 8th, and 11th graders. And in Oregon, it's like 70 to 80 percent of the kids know or see bullying going on and seeing the shaming. There's several different aspects. The shaming aspects, actually violence and some other aspect. So the awareness of the bullying that's going on with the students, among the students, is very high. Mm -hmm. It's very, very low among the educators. Yeah. And this is both in, in suicide and bullying. This is a situation where they, this, particularly the teachers, and they, they play it off on the counselor, but the teachers are with the students like six or seven hours a day. Yeah. And they see interactions all the time and how somebody's recluse or involved or depressed, etc. if they know what to look for. Mm -hmm. And the same thing can happen in bullying and seeing what's going on. Thank goodness they're putting cameras in a lot of buses mm -hmm. because a lot of stuff goes on the bus and the poor bus driver, they're supposed, in Oregon, I think they're supposed to stop if there's anything going on yeah. until it settles down. Or call the parent and have the kid come to the bus where it is, or the the parents come to the bus and pick up the kid. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, that doesn't happen a lot. It, it, bullying on the bus happens a lot. It just, before the cameras, there wasn't, you know, uh, getting kids home and dark during the, the winter and all. Yeah, uh, yeah. But that's a big thing. So you've got students, uh, three-fourths of the student body that sees it. The problem is they... they stay numb about it. They mm -hmm. don't do anything. Sometimes they sort of join in because, oh, I'm one of the group. If I join in, I'm kidding this kid. But most of them just stay there. They're mm -hmm. bystanders, what we call. 
that second point is to get them to be an upstander. And what an upstander is, is somebody that says, hey, don't do that, that's not cool. And if we train that into, say, one, one person, and that person stands up, then we've got some other people that have been on the line, but they wouldn't do it as the original protester. Mm -hmm. And they jump on board, and usually if two people say that's not cool, the bullying stops. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so it's just a really simple task, but it's changing a culture in a school system and within our whole society of whistleblowers get the raw end of the deal. You know, and they're the first ones that are attacked and, and that whole thing. So it, it takes a lot of guts to stand up and be a whistleblower. It takes a lot of guts to stand up and be an upstander. But we need to teach that in our kids because our whole society is dependent on people really speaking about injustice and what's going on. And as we see with Me Too and all these other things that are happening in the this week, yeah. you know, we've got to we've got to protect the person that is the whistleblower mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or the upstander, and make it one of the things that happens in bullying a lot of times is a a bullying and there's even a, f a film on this I forget the name of it um, is that a, a kid gets bullied so much. In fact, weapons at school, I don't know in California or Oregon, but I know a national statistic, and weapons in school are found mostly in carried by kids who are being bullied. Wow, okay. And, and so you've got, you know, you don't want weapons at school, but a kid that's being bullied puts up with it sometimes two or three years, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, and gets to that point, they can't stand it any longer, and they fight back. Wow. And what happens up north is that very often, in the cases that come to me and talk to me about it, the, the bullied student is the one that gets suspended. And, and they don't work with, or the, the ones I know of, they don't work with the bully it's assumed that the the bullied student that that couldn't stand it any longer fought back, mm -hmm. and then they are the ones that have the immediate witnesses, and of course the, yeah. the bullies got all his friends that are her friends that are there. Uh -huh. and, and you've got the one the yeah. one the victim who's who's been a victim of ongoing uh, bullying who lashes out finally, and that's what right. everybody sees. And, right, yeah, and yeah. one of the things is that seventy five percent of school shootings are by kids that were bullied. Wow. So you see the revenge gets even bigger. Mm -hmm. Somebody really can't, well, in season two of 13 Reasons Why, which I think is one of the most dangerous Netflix series ever. Really? Yes, we've got a number of suicides. Within a month of that coming out up in Portland, they had a number of suicides, number one, where kids had emulated the taping, and also kids ended up in the ER who had admitted to doing, emulating the taping, wow. and they ended up in the ER. And of course, it it was 13 hours of the, a kid, instead of having it once a week mm -hmm. or once a month, the kid could see it all you just binge it, with yeah. a, a couple of days, mm -hmm. you know. And in season two, <clears throat> I watched the, the for people that had seen it, and, and within two days of when that aired, when that broke, the there were people that had already kids that had already analyzed all 13 of them and put them on YouTube. Wow. But one of the things that that happened in in uh, season two is a a guy that gets bullied, and I don't know the story because I couldn't watch 13 hours of it. I I got through three of season one, but I I looked on the websites to see what people's analyzing was, and then I checked out a few of them. Mm -hmm. And there's this one kid that, I don't know what he did to one of the bullies, to, to, told, him, to, told about him or did something. But in season two, he's in the bathroom, and they, uh, they come in, 
and they basically bash his head against the wall and then do something that we can't talk about on the air, uh, but it's on film uh, in the show. And in season one, it showed uh, it showed as much as you can of a rape, mm -hmm. and it showed as much as you can of a suicide. And you're giving this to kids that are on the edge anyway. Yeah. Many of them are on the edge, and they can't deal with it. But but the whole point there was that 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 kid they talked him down, so he didn't. He w he was going to the school dance and going to take out with a number of weapons was going to take out the kids. Wow. You know, and they t talked him down. One of the leads in the show talked him down. Thank goodness. But that that is a real true indication of what happens when you know the person that uh, did the Montreal shootings a number of years ago, mm -hmm. 14 people, and the woman that drove through the people at the McDonald's and all were all revenge issues. And and with our, well, I see California, I think, is, where is it nationally? They're, oh, uh, Trump is actually going to propose us to limit bump stocks, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, high capacity rounds. We'll see if it happens. Yeah. But, or what? I'll finish on that one. Um, the, uh, does it, I don't want to. I don't yeah. want to derail you, but yeah. does it worry you that we end up we start talking about things like you know bullying in, in school, and then we're talking about you know high capacity uh, <laughs> magazines for automatic weapons or semi-automatic yeah. weapons? I mean, does that worry you that we in this society that those things can follow upon each other like that in, well, in a conversation? Well, it's actually. Going in reverse. How so? We're talking about what happens, high capacity, killing a lot of kids at the mm -hmm. same time, and then what the causes are. We talked about the causes first, and here's the outcome. Mm -hmm. so I just mean, I just it, mean it, that it, we're, having, it, we're talking it, it, about the environment that right. kids have to, to oh. exist in every yeah, day that, right. that kind of is this full spectrum violence. You know, yes. it's just ridiculous that, that in, any of this that we have to talk about. I mean, I grew up with bullies. Sure, you had yeah. bullies in school. But that's kind of where it started and it ended, and you had the teacher and however you dealt with it there. But now we can kind of, maybe it's because we're more aware of it nowadays, but we can kind of see how this sort of thing is just marbled through all of society and that it's not just one little isolated thing. Like, I remember it in, right. in grade school, that maybe it is actually a spectrum. I think it is. Mm -hmm. I think it, that is a concern because uh, violence has been supported in the culture mm -hmm. and encouraged in the culture and it is division has been encouraged in the culture so not only is our culture magnifying that but the schools are they've got mixed culture etc and and it is up that we had um, when uh, right after the inauguration up in our middle school there was a chant uh, build a wall build a wall during lunch you know, and they shut it down very quickly, but that's it has allowed part of the culture that has been th seething underneath to have permission to come up mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. and get support for coming up. Yeah, and voicing. Yeah, be celebrated. Yeah. And and the the people that had been in support of diversity and tolerance and all that kind of stuff, some of them are really coming out, but a lot of them have gone back in the woodwork. Yeah, yeah. You know, which, it's frustrating well, to me to it, watch that. <laughs> it's sad. Yeah, yeah. And it's a sad example for kids. Mm -hmm, you know? mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. What are we teaching them by, right. by, by sitting back and being silent about right. all of these things? You're right. absolutely right. Wow. And, and thank goodness you're in a county that's got a humble. And really speaks out mm -hmm, mm -hmm. about about these things and continues to speak out. What I am very pleased with is all over the country, people are railing against what's going on with the nomination. Mm -hmm. So they're really speaking out and in groups where it feels safe. What happened on the elevator 
there with I forget the senator and Flake with the two yeah. women in front. Yeah, right. Yeah, and and that woman had never intended to voice even let anybody know mm -hmm. that she'd been assaulted, and it just it got to that point where, like the the bullied kid can't handle it anymore. It got to that point of I can't stay quiet anymore. Yeah. I've got to make my voice known because maybe nobody else on this elevator will, you know, and maybe it'll be going on notice. And some, thank goodness, cell phones, you know, recorded it or mm -hmm, camera mm -hmm. did. I don't know what, what really recorded it, but it, people can't hide their faces anymore if they're in public. Yeah, they can still do it on the internet. Yeah, and yeah, that's sure. that is a scary, scary thing about our future is mm -hmm. what can go on, uh, but behind closed doors, really. Yeah. One thing we, you talked about uh, uh, these months kind of being out of out of uh, sequence, right? Like maybe it would make more sense if uh, Bullying Prevention Month or Awareness Month came before Suicide Awareness and right. Prevention Month. But uh, one thing I learned recently, and I did not know this, taking a class on uh, on uh, recognizing uh, um, uh, youth mental issues and how to deal with how to deal with uh, a youth that's going through something, whether it's a anxiety or some more you know deeper pervasive sort of thing that uh, uh, is kind of beneath the surface. But I learned in this seminar um, that you don't skirt around the issue if suicide is suspected in any in any way with the, with a young person. Say it. Ask them straight out: Are you planning to hurt yourself? Right. Do you have thoughts of hurting yourself? You don't. You don't kind of like tiptoe around it, but bring it right out into the bright, into the air, and the light, and and address it, and 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 get a response from them. That's something I didn't know. I didn't know how to deal. With. Right. Well, that's one of the things about stigma, and that is a big thing, not only with students. We've got a major problem in in Curry County with veterans. Mm -hmm. We've already mm -hmm. had two that I know of. Mm -hmm. We had a record last year, or not a record, we had five of 14 uh, killed themselves Holy last year, and that's three more than we had in 2016. Oh, wow. The, our high year was in 2008, which was the, the bubble, the housing crisis. Mm -hmm. We had 11 suicides that year, seven of them were vets. So on a per capita basis, I don't have the figures yet for the last two years, but a few years ago, we were number one in the state in per capita vet suicide. Oh my. Now what happens is stigma. In the military, in the police, in, in society, it's not, you can talk about your cancer, or you can talk about your broken arm, or oh, sign my cast, or can I sign your cast? But yeah, suicide, point. which is controls your brain controls your whole body mm -hmm. everything you do is something not to be talked about and the biggest issue there is and particularly for men is depression and depression is something that is a biological thing it's something that at a level it's not something to get over it or or patch it up or pull your bootstraps up you know yeah. handle it deal with it Suicide or de depression at a level you can't do it that way. Mm -hmm. It is impossible to do it that way and it only gets worse. And so it's recognizing those aspects. But the thing that you talked about last year, it was several of the organizations were directed not to talk to directed to not to tell their, their club groups to talk about asking if somebody is going to kill themselves. Wow. Who is this? <laughs> they know. Okay, all right, all right. And I put together a page. Uh, it's probably 20-some organizations and OHA, Oregon Health Authority, and Oregon uh, Department of Education and the big uh, suicide programs, etc. Uh, all of the statements from each one of those organizations, and they continue to say there isn't one piece of evidence that a person will start thinking about suicide more or amp it up. But it, it, there is a ton of research that says that opens a door. It shows somebody cares. And that's a big thing about really checking in. What I've 
doing today is the last month I've had a, a rack in 38 locations here in, in uh, Crescent City. And I just changed yours in your office. And for the last month, it's been black and white, and it said zero attempts since September is Suicide Prevention Month. That ended a couple of days ago, and I put back in one that we've had up there for a couple of years now that says in letters only, are you okay? Mm -hmm. And it's a, a very simple question to ask. One of the things that bugs me is, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. And it's like we minimized really that response. And I'm gonna, I wrote it this morning, I'm gonna make a list of things to start a conversation with okay. that don't include how are you or <laughs> how are you doing. Don't invite that quick sort right. of on off sort yeah. of thing. Yeah, yeah. But <laughs> get to see what the warning signs are so that you will, I will guarantee you, you'll see it in your friends. Mm -hmm. One out of five people right now and one out of five students have a mental health disorder. And 75% of those start before the kid is 24. Mm -hmm. I think it's 50% start before they're 14. So we can see this happening, but if we don't deal with it early, it becomes ingrained and much more difficult to deal with in the future. Yeah. And so if we really, individuals, you and I, the, the course that you took, I mean, is, is outstanding. And we've got programs like ASSIST and mental health first aid and a number of different programs mm -hmm. that people can go to and sign up and some of them are free, you know, to really see what the signs are so that you can not be a bystander and notice this in your friends and possibly even in your own family members. Mm -hmm. That you see them all the time, that looks like a, a normal behavior. But it may be a behavior that is uh, a warning sign that's just been there forever yeah. or for a long time. Yeah, it just seems normal and, to you. And yeah. in, in getting help on that issue and just going to a GP mm -hmm. and next time you go to the doctor and have a, a checkup to be sure there isn't something going on, they've got questions they ask and they can determine, give them a possible diagnosis on, on your answers mm -hmm. and in a pretty quick order. And get there and, and get a checkup the next time, you know. I want to see if there's any chance I've got depression. And there's actually something on the web that you can go to. I've got them on my website at zeroattempts.org mm -hmm. that you can go in and check um, and get a depression check. Mm -hmm. And that's not as good as getting somebody face-to-face. -face. Yeah, but it might be a first step, right? Right, yeah. right. Yeah. Wow. And, and men in particular mm -hmm. have to really look at depression. Because eighty percent of successful suicides are men. Wow. Eighty percent of suicide attempts are women. But they don't use lethal means. Mm -hmm. And the reason men use lethal means is not because they've got guns. It's because they've been told all their life to man up. Big boys don't cry. Handle it. Deal with it. Cowboy up. All those kind of messages. So they've been taught to be a tough guy. And so a tough guy doesn't emote, mm -hmm. except when it gets to the point that he, he takes out a village in Vietnam or something sure. like that. Yeah, yeah. You know? But what I like to see is, don't be a tough guy anymore. It's much better to be a strong man. Mm -hmm. And that does what uh, George, uh, uh, General Schwarzkopf said, I don't trust a man who doesn't cry. Oh, wow. And he sees it all the time. Mm -hmm. A guy that's pent up is a tough guy. He's the one that can explode. Yeah, he's going to snap. And cause right. a lot of die. Yeah. The guy that emotes, and thank goodness we're seeing some football players do it, mm -hmm. and we're seeing sports members that are actually emoting, mm -hmm. you know, and it's a, it's a healthy emotion, you know. There, there's a, a song on Country Western I just heard for the first time, Take a Drunk Girl Home. Mm -hmm. And it is really cool in that the, the guy takes her home and, and puts her on the couch or something like that, leaves her keys on the dresser and a note, and leaves the hallway, li hallway light on 
and leaves and locks the door. That's sweet. Wow. You know? Yeah, he make said, sure she gets he, home. Okay, and well. he says, that's the difference between a boy and a man. There you go. You know, so it's getting this culture mm -hmm. to not be tough and handle it, but it's much stronger, makes a much stronger man that can ask for help. That's true. Now, do you, what's your feeling with youth today? I feel that a lot of youth in the interacting that I have with my own kids and with their friends and, and kids here at KFUG and stuff, that the, by and large, I get the feeling that today's young people, teenagers and, you know, getting into, into 20 or so, are pretty well adjusted. It seems to me. I don't know if that's if that's true or not. But it, you were talking about how how we raise uh, we raise boys to, to sort of hold things in, and I was certainly raised that way. It doesn't seem like kids are raised that way anymore. That there might be something happening with young people, and I see it with their gender awareness, with their with their social awareness, that there might actually be a change happening generationally. Do you feel that, or am I imagining that? You're not imagining it. Okay. And. It's, it's a transition. I uh, put together a group, uh, Fathers Network, back in 1974 when I got a divorce and found out that my wife wanted me to raise our eight-year-old daughter, which I did. And uh, I found that the only people that I could go to to talk about raising kids were women. Mm -hmm. And what they said about raising kids didn't jive for me. It just that, that doesn't fit. They, they've got a different way, or uh, many women have a different way of raising kids, generally, that culture, than men do, if they're allowed to, if they aren't criti criticized for, for the way they put on a diaper. If I put on a diaper wrong, let me do it and I'll figure it out. <laughs> but you criticize me for it, and you got the job, the yeah. life, yeah. you know. <laughs> but that started where... And I did workshops for women and men for 19 years, five, six-day workshops. Mm -hmm. um, and as I saw back then, it, you didn't, a man didn't go to therapy unless his wife drug him there. And that's, you know, you can't change, really have change unless somebody wants to change. And I've seen that progress year after year and a number of years ago I went down to Chico State and I was a fraternity guy and worked with fraternities around their macho culture and all and strengthening through something I forget but changing the the fraternity system of of uh, harassment and all and I'd see the guys you know arms around each other and that kind of stuff in the jock fraternities and there was a, a breaking down of this stay straight don't touch don't hug hug and I've seen it grow and grow and grow, and what has happened in probably the last 15 years is the whole tolerance movement and opening up and being tolerant, not keeping in our little separate groups, but being tolerant and actually wanting to reach out and learn about another culture. You've got a particular culture here that probably is the biggest one in the world, I mean in the United States, and I don't know that as a fact, but the the Tong culture, the Asian oh the Hmong Hmong yes Hmong, mm -hmm. and I, I I'm actually going to be at the national uh, binational uh, health fair tomorrow mm -hmm. here, and a couple of years ago they performed and I got to talk to them, you know, and I never even knew that that culture existed. No way, yeah. you know, and in opening up and cross cultural, and now where it is safer for LGBT kids mm -hmm. to come out. Mm -hmm. It's safer for trans kids to come out. And we are seeing trans kids come out at five years old because all of a sudden the culture recognizes it's okay. You know, and, and they still, as you know, go up against a lot of abuse and a much higher rate of harassment and a much higher rate of suicide. But they're, they're getting that foothold, and they're getting a foothold in organizations like uh, uh, GSA, uh, Gay Straight Alliance, mm -hmm. and up in Brookings, it's the LGBTQ plus straight group. Mm -hmm. you know, and they're getting more of heterosexuals to join in with the gay rights groups and communicate and get to know each other and see how alike we are, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, and honor that. 
And so there's more tolerance there, and what we have trouble with is older people. Exactly. Because they're still in their culture yeah. and their mindset. Yeah. And they've come out, they're starting to bridge a little bit, and uh, but it's the young people that are sort of pushing upstream instead of the older people pushing downstream. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I totally agree with you. That's the sense I've gotten. But there's just a lot more pressure on them now. Just an incredible, yeah. much, much more pressure. I, I just see, I see in, in young people a, a lot more willingness to experience and express empathy. Yeah, and and that right. that gives me hope for the future because yeah. yeah, they are facing a lot of a yeah. lot of, of top heavy pressure, a lot of societal things right. all around them, twenty four hours a day right. now. You know, right. things right. that you and I, when we were young, we could get away from. You know, you right. just go in your room and <laughs> right. you're away from it. Right. But no, you can't get away from yeah, it. Now. You can't get it away wow. from it. So, uh, just really quick, how did you get into this? I know we've had this conversation before yeah. on KFUG, but I've forgotten. How did, how did you come to be a... And, and also, at some point, I would like to hear more about being a, a single dad in the 70s. Oh. Because you were in no man's land, basically, back then, weren't be you? Before uh, Kramer versus Kramer. Yeah, and Mr. Mom and all yeah. of that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow, wow, that's yeah. something. That's got to... Well, what was your first question? Uh, uh, just about no. how did you get into all of oh, to, to, the, okay. to the advocacy and, and doing okay. what you do? Well, divorce, mm -hmm. and uh, I, my wife, did not want. She went to college on what we call the MRS degree. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> and, and and that was at Stevens and Mills and all of those big women's colleges were basically teaching a woman how to be a very knowledgeable wife. Wow. And uh, I forget her name, but uh, a famous actress did a movie a number of years ago where she was a teacher at one of those colleges, and she was trying to get the the girls to become independent in the world mm -hmm. and not in a dependent role. Well, um, we went to court, and I was suicidal. And in Kansas, you have to wait six months. But if you are a threat to yourself or somebody else, it can happen immediately. Oh, wow, okay. So we went for an immediate divorce. And in that, in the judge's chambers, he wanted our daughter to be with the mother. He was 65 years old, had never given a child to the mother, particularly, I mean, to, to a father, father yeah. and particularly a daughter. Wow, yeah. And so he said he disagrees with our judgment that he's going to assign our daughter to my former wife. She refused on the stand. Mm -hmm. He called a, uh, a session. He, he'd have to make a decision overnight. I went to TGNY to the camera place and got photos of myself and my daughter for passports and went down the passport office that morning to get passports. Oh, wow. Because I didn't want to be in a country that did that. Uh -huh. We went to court, and he allowed it. He said, this is the first time I've ever done this. And, uh, uh, and, I, and he gave two-thirds of my, my income, my house and everything, to her because he didn't want an indigent woman on the rolls of the state. But and so really, so, left you with a third of, of what you had right, to raise your daughter to with raise you? my daughter, <laughs> the house, everything else. You oh know? my gosh! But um, that really got me, and I've never been part of the father's rights movement. Mm -hmm. I think there's some value there, but there's a lot of anger there. But I developed the father's network, so I grew grew in men that had were raising their kids mm -hmm. and we got to talk about that and that really got me started and then i moved to california and got in uh, the california men's gathering and rights uh, all kinds of rights but primarily a lot around sexism and racism and and all of that and mm -hmm. i was actually in a movie um, called the color of fear that's in 1994 that's still being used in diversity programs oh, wow um, on on race that's and cool. I was one of two 
I call myself a Europe, uh, Northern European American. Because <laughs> I'm not an American, I'm a Northern European American, mm -hmm. though my family came over here in the mid-1700s. Mm -hmm. right? <laughs> uh, but that really got me started. And I came up to, after retirement, came up to Brookings and got involved with the uh, Curry Community Commission on Children and Family and worked a lot around the drug an alcohol problem in the schools, and then the state disbanded those programs, and 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 there was a drug coalition, and so I had a uh, an acquaintance that I knew who was a, a thespian, junior a thespian in the school, mm -hmm. and uh, she had come out as a, a bisexual, and she got so harassed by that that uh, she killed herself. Oh my God! In, in 2012. Mm -hmm. And that that was a big trigger for me to shift, stay with the bullying stuff, but shift into suicide. And I actually got a, a headstone put in against the superintendent's wishes, put in the ground at the high school oh, wow. in her honor uh, to, uh, uh, to support her. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a little bench there, they used to call it the buddy bench, where if people were feeling alone and all, um, go there and somebody that feels empathy comes up and talks to you. Oh. And that's where I had it placed, up at the school. Mm -hmm. But that's the activism. I, actually, we, were, we went in the mid-70s, or late 70s, early 80s, down, protested the California, Miss California pageant. Mm -hmm and worked with Annie Sprinkle and those people. Oh, right, right. Oh my God, I haven't heard that name in so long. Yeah. Annie Sprinkle, oh yeah. wow, okay. <laughs> and one of the women that had won Miss America and went down and protested and actually it was live audition mm -hmm. or a live final at that time mm -hmm. on television. And some of our our guys from the California Anti-Sexist Men's Political Caucus, Camp Caucus, went on stage just after she'd been presented the crown uh -huh. and interrupted the whole thing. Oh, wow. Treat women, I forget what the slogan was, but treat women as women and not meat or uh -huh. something like uh -huh. that. And it shut it down. Oh, my God. So, and they moved it down to San Diego. Uh -huh. and, and started taping it, right? And, well, and we went down to San Diego. Uh -huh. And so they figured, well, we'll bring it back to Santa Cruz. But we did that, and Diablo... Uh, mm -hmm. okay. uh, Diablo Canyon, Canyon, yeah. and Livermore. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. The guy wasn't one of our members, but put his legs on the track yeah. And yeah. when the train rolled over him, and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. So, I've been. It's guerrilla theater is my ploy. Oh wow! You know, is is do something that that oh yeah what. Yeah. I got stories about Annie that we'll we'll talk about off radio. Okay, all right. So that's the next time you need to come in. Cause right. I, I want to talk right. to you about your activism, yeah. the gorilla, yeah. the right. gorilla art, the right. gorilla theater, and, and Annie Sprinkles, <laughs> and all of that because yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, right. I remember all of that and the and the and the uh, the, the the eco activists and the and the bomb in the car and all yeah. of the uh, oh gosh, I forget who it was. Oh, who the, the bomb the went the off and tree. The, Tree climber, right? And that that whole bit, uh huh, so uh huh, off, off her. Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then yeah, there was a thing I went to in Berkeley once, and it was the uh, Jello Biafra from the Dead Kennedys was there, and it was a, it was a, it was a. Uh, uh, they were raising money to help yeah. to help in the defense of somebody. I forget which which issue it was. If it was if it was the bombing, uh, uh, or when the bomb went off under the car seat, or if it was the yeah. the, the guy who had laid on the tracks. But it was right yeah. about that same time when I was yeah. in the Bay Area. So yeah, I'd love to have that so, conversation yeah. and find out what a real I mean because that's like performance art social activism all yeah. of that that kind of spectacle yeah. that's beautiful that's yeah. cool it's fun <laughs> and scary yeah, I bet, you know, I bet. It's, yeah. it's can be dangerous mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I have uh, Che Guevara's motto if you aren't getting shot at you aren't doing good work oh wow that's great <laughs> all right Gordon how can people get a hold of you to find out more um, <clears throat> To get one of the uh, uh, you know the, uh, the, the the stands with the with the the, the flyers or yeah. the or the buttons, are you still doing the semicolon buttons as well? No, I've got a few left. I'm doing those in the school. I mm -hmm. gave away twenty thousand of them, mm -hmm. and uh, Del Norte County too. But we've only got twenty two thousand people. Yeah. In yeah. in Curry County. Oh and wow! So Even there, fewer than, than Del Norte County. <laughs> well, no, but I mean, uh, twenty thousand 
not nearly as much down here, of course, mm -hmm. with the county, and it, they cost me 18 cents a piece. Okay. And so I've I've shifted off to just staying with the cards mm -hmm. and hope people carry the cards because that's the important thing. I I do have the the buttons at the schools and the therapists, um, Remy Vista, mm -hmm. and all have have the buttons for the kids. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I have seen them on a lot of backpacks down here. Yeah, yeah. But if they want to learn more about what's going on in suicide, go to uh, zeroattempts.org. And I got tons of stuff there. Okay. If they want it on bullying, go to the citizens who care.org. And if you want to get in touch with me, Go to zero attempts at AOL dot com. Okay. All right. So just basically through the through the two websites right. is best to get great. Right. Gordon, thank you. Is there anything that uh, that you wanted to get out and uh, and had been talking to the other radio stations and everybody about that we didn't touch on today? One. Okay. Well, there's lots. Not I mean, bad. We we could do a, a twenty four hour <laughs> marathon to raise money for K Fund. There, there you go. All right. <laughs> twenty four hours, huh? All yeah. right. I'm going to need to make a pot of coffee. So. <laughs> uh, I don't do coffee, but I'll figure it I'll out. I'll do your coffee for I, you. I, I, only, I was up at 2.30 this morning. Oh, so my gosh. I get about five hours sleep. Oh, the man. big thing mm -hmm. is 90% of students who are in crisis will not call a suicide hotline. Mm -hmm. They don't even talk on their cell phones. They will text. And the important thing is to get that text number out. And it's national. It's been around for five years. You taught, you've spoken about this yeah, previously. Yeah, and it's seven four one seven four one. And and what it's just spreading here. When I came, when I brought this out, I think two years ago, there wasn't anybody, any of the health professionals that knew that number, knew mm -hmm. it was available. Mm -hmm. And yet there were forty five million texts to it at that time. Wow. Today. Last year, 64 million. Today, a, a couple of weeks ago, 81 million. Oh my gosh. Now, in Oregon, it's just beginning to spread. And I talked to them a week ago, and they had uh, seven, 17,500, around 17,500 over the last 12 months mm -hmm. of, of unique texters. So that's quite a bit because. Yeah. Adding that up, I, I so that's not seventeen thousand five hundred texts. That's seventeen thousand five hundred people. Yeah, wow, In, okay. individuals. Yeah, that's wild. And that that is big. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, the others, the eighty-one million is texters. Okay, but that's only in five years, okay. and it's confidential, twenty-four hours, etc. One other quick thing, for law enforcement, law enforcement and and veterans have a problem with admitting or going for help, mm -hmm. and that's one of the reasons we got such a high suicide rate in the military. And number six, law enforcement is number six on suicides by profession. Because if the culture says, basically, if you report that you've got a mental health problem, you're going to lose your life wages. Mm -hmm. What There's a copline.org, and they've got an 800 number. And it goes to law enforcement people. They're the only counselors that answer. And they will not uh, identify. Wow. They are not mandatory reporters. They refuse to be mandatory reporters. They are not going to report you unless you ask them in the call, would you call 911 for me? They're not going to do that. So it allows the guys that need trouble and depression. I mean, one in five of everybody. So you know you've got law enforcement out there that have problems and this gives them an avenue to go to. Mm -hmm. So those are the two big things I think individuals can immediately do to really get help for themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Do you, what, do you, what's the, uh, the, the police line? It's, do you well, I don't know the, the number, but it's uh, copline.org. Okay. And they've got that information there. Yeah. I've got it on my website, actually, zeroattempts.org slash emergencies.html. 
Sounds like zeroattempts.org is the place to go first. It's got a anything. lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Gordon, thank you very much for coming in and talking to us. And uh, uh, we'd, I'd love to do that again. And I'd love to have all these other conversations that we just hinted at today. During, That'd be during, great. That'd be great. I'd love Thanks it. much. It's, it's good to be back. Thank you for, for doing this service. Uh, really, we started in Del Norte with KFUG. Oh, seriously? Was that the first buttons, come, really? With Jacob. Patterson. Oh, right on. That's right. He's the one. <laughs> With that, Gender Talk, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I was on Gender that Talk. That was the first time yeah. I saw you. That's right. Yeah. Oh, well, we're, yeah. we're honored. That's yeah. wonderful. And if you if you yeah. talk to Jacob anytime soon, yeah. get him and Rachel to come back on and bring Gender yeah. Talk back. I think, um, <laughs> I just, oh, he's working, I believe, with the, the Teen Center. 